Good morning and happy Friday. I'm so happy to be back with you guys today. It's been a couple few weeks of for sort of weirdness and stuff uh, getting, getting in the way of our getting together. So I'm really happy to see you and I am really excited to take your questions. Uh, we've got a lot of really interesting and cool questions this week. As usual, you guys are bringing up issues that I think are really going to be beneficial. The answers are going to really be beneficial for everyone to hear. So uh, just a couple of things I wanted to mention really quick up top, little housekeeping stuff. It's not medical, but the big science event this week was the fusion experience at the Livermore lab. Um, they were able, after many decades of research, to actually use laser and plasma heated materials to create energy. And uh, this is probably barely in my lifetime. Uh, it would, it would, if, if I were going to plug something into a wall and get power from, from fusion, I'm guessing it would be toward the very end of my life, if at all. But very excited, very interesting for, from a scientific point of view to think about the possibility of unlimited energy at a very low price which does not create any sort of toxic byproduct. We've never had anything like that in my lifetime. So very exciting. A second thing that came up this week that I'm really interested in going over, and I will go over with you in much greater detail, is about the horrible neurological condition, which we see every day and honestly try not to even talk about, but it's devastating our communities, it's devastating our, our entire society right now, and that is depression, and depression's ugly, nasty cousin, anxiety. These are two things which are just an absolute, to call them epidemic is, is an understatement. They're, they're devastating. But there's been a lot of comment and talk on our channel in the past in video format and others about uh, antidepressant medications, and you know, in my mind, anti-psychiatric medications are sort of like the new vaccination. There's a lot of people with very strong feelings about them. Uh, some of this tends to be on the side of misinformation, in my opinion. Some of it tends to be on the side of, uh, of concern, but somewhere in the middle is the truth. And one of our goals here at Best Practice is to really try to get down to the apolitical, unemotional science of things, to try to really get down to what you need to know to make good decisions about your health. And depression is something, depression and anxiety are things that are affecting so many of us today that, uh, anyway, the development was, for the first time in history, imaging, an imaging technique was developed to, to image the neurotransmitter composition of a part of the brain. In, in real time, um, and in particular with serotonin. So we've actually, oh, it's not just not true. We've had that in the past with dopamine, uh, and it has been a big help with Parkinson's, with functional imaging. But this week we got a little bit of that with serotonin, which is thought by many people to be the key neurotransmitter involved with depression. And a really interesting report actually came out in October, and but just now is getting picked up by the neuroscience press. And something I think uh, you need to know about, and we're going to go over. So just a flash forward to next week where we're going to go over some of that information about the new imaging of depression and some implications that that might have to anyone who's taking an antidepressant medication. Paxil, anyone? Uh, a, lot, a lot of people. A lot of people are on these medications, and this is stuff that I, th I think you need to know. All right. No more diversion. Let's get to it. You ready? Let's get down to it. Uh, here's the questions that we have for this week. The first one comes from Old Puck 81. I hope I'm saying that right. I think it's Old Puck. How is lateral stability? And this was, uh, they watched our video, uh, ACDF, uh, neck fusion versus artificial disc, ADR, artificial disc replacement, a new study. And uh, this is one of our most popular, it's actually one of our top 10 videos. If you, if you have neck problems and are thinking about having neck fusion surgery, I highly recommend this video. It, kind of, it goes into depth about this decision. Uh, you know, one thing about surgeons, uh, surgeons function at such a high level, but 
for most of them, the things we do are the things they do are so risky that they tend to sort of be very fixed in their ways. They're very conservative, and that's what you want, right? You don't want a airline pilot who's learning to fly the plane as learn, learn, building the plane as he flies it, right? You want you want stability and knowledge and and process, but that also the dark side of that, the flip side, conservative also means very slow to change. Artificial disk replacement is a new concept. It's really within the last 10 years. And to have multiple approved devices really within the last five years. But so something that you sometimes need to talk through with your doctor, if it's something that interests you and it may be a benefit to you. And your doctor is your expert, but who's the quarterback of your own care? You are, you are. So it's very appropriate to, and I can tell you, I was a surgeon for 20 years. Uh, no surgeon, if a surgeon is offended at a patient bringing something up, run away. <laughs> that is not a surgeon. Surgeons are smart, interested, uh, social people. They wanna talk to you about what you're thinking and what you have, and they wanna hear new ideas and give you their take on them. Uh, so definitely something you wanna, you wanna, it's very appropriate to bring up with a surgeon and you wanna do it. Now, here's the question. How is lateral stability preserved so a level doesn't go into spondylolisthesis with the artificial disc replacement? And does it make sense if a patient needs multi-level, like three or four level fusion, to put an artificial disc replacement in the middle adjacent to the fusions? Great questions. So uh, the first one is lateral means side to side. So if we're looking straight on, or this is, uh, he was talking about the neck, but let's talk about the low back where I happen to have that model here now. So lateral means this dimension, side to side. And what's important is the disc looks like, when you look at a model like this, the disc looks like it's what's holding everything together, right? Wrong, it's back here. What's prevent, what causes lateral stability is actually the joints, the facet joints. And these are in the lumbar, but it's just equally true in the neck. And uh, the disc is a shock absorber. It does provide a little bit of side-to-side -side stability, but not much. The vast majority of that side-to-side -side stability comes from the facet joints. So in artificial disc replacement, if we take out this disc and put in an artificial one, what provides the lateral side-to-side -side stability? Well, the same thing that always did, the joints, the facet joints. Now, remember, the artificial disc has, uh, it does retain motion between the levels, but the bone from each level grows into the implant. So the implant is locked from above, locked from below, and then a little bit of resistance in the implant, but most of that is coming from the joints. Second part of that question, the second longer part was, well, okay, if I, if I need a multi-level fusion, let's say I need three or very rarely even four levels uh, ACDF fused, uh, why not put an artificial disc replacement in the middle to preserve some motion? And that's exactly how they're being used today. It's a really good idea, right? Have If you need four levels fused, how about fusing two levels and then artificial disc and then the bottom level? The idea is to break up that long moment arm, which you should just think of as a lever. When you fuse multiple levels together, they create a lever, which can then act on the adjacent level and cause adjacent level, the next door neighbor breakdown faster. So by one concept of putting an artificial disc in there is that you can break up that long lever and make it better. Now, interestingly, in the study, there really wasn't much evidence for that. There really wasn't as much evidence for that as we thought we would see. But still, good idea, and sometimes good ideas, you just have to, if there's no downside, if there's no significant risk, follow through with them and, and see what happens. So, oh my gosh, great question. Thanks thanks so much for asking it. A lot, a lot to unpack there. All right, this is from Pradeep, uh, Fit, Pardeep Fitness Channel. Hold on, I gotta put my glasses on. Pardeep Fitness Channel, yes. Sir, kindly guide me regarding the following reports. My report says, Number one, disc desiccation improving L4-5 and L5-S1 levels. Number two, L4-5 shows diffuse disc bulge with annular tear, in indenting the fecal sac, not compressing the nerve roots 
causing residual canal diameter of 14.5 millimeters. Um, so that, that, this is an MRI report, and this is the radiologist measuring the width of the spinal canal. So if this is a guy facing you or a gal, and then we put them on their side, so they're laying on their, I'm sorry, they're laying on their stomach, the width of the spinal canal is this, is this, is this from side to side, and the depth of the spinal canal is that. A normal depth of your spinal canal, it varies, right? As you might imagine, we come in different flavors, right? Some of us are shorter, some of us are taller. It's the same thing with our spinal canals. Some of us are th deeper, some of us are less deep, some of us are wider, some of us are less wide. Three centimeters is a common kind of ballpark level for the width of the spine, for the thickness of the spinal canal in a healthy young child. So about three centimeters, which is 30 millimeters. And uh, this person, Pardeep, uh, is now 14.5 millimeters. That means half of the spinal canal is gone. About half of it's gone. So that's, that's significant narrowing. That is significant narrowing. And the medical term for narrowing is stenosis. So we've got significant stenosis here. Um, at L5-S1, there's a central disc protrusion, indenting the fecal sac and not compressing the nerve root, measuring 14.5 millimeters. Okay, so that's that. Now, so that's, those are the MRI findings. And Pardeep really does me a, a solid hair. They give me the MRI and then they tell me the symptoms because this is what a doctor, a surgeon in particular, has to do. They have to look at you, compare your examination and history to what they see on the MRI, and then they ask themselves, is there a structural thing that an operation could do that is causing the symptoms that would then, if the, MRI, if the operation was carried out safely, would that eliminate the symptoms and make the person better? That's the magic of surgery. That's how they make those decisions. So here's your symptoms. No pain. Ooh, okay, so right now, whenever I hear no pain, my first think is no pain, no surgery. It's not totally true. The only exception is stenosis. You could have essentially no pain, but still end up needing to have uh, decompression surgery to make sure your nerves don't get squished and fail. No pain. That's good news. Uh, heavy stiffness. Mm. That's interesting. That can be a lot of things. A lot of things. I mean, that's, that could be Parkinson's is uh, rigidity and stiffness is a part of that, having nothing to do with the spine. That could be spinal stenosis. Some people feel heaviness or stiffness as their stenosis complaint. And we do have stenosis on the MRI. So is that the cause? Could be. Gonna, let's listen for more. Um, sitting issue. Okay, there's no pain, so what's the issue sitting? I'm not sure. Can't stand for more, a long time in the same position. Hmm, can't stand, but why? It's not pain, so it must be weakness? I don't know. Some feelings of numbness and in the legs area also. Ah. Numbness in the legs is usually stenosis. And here we've got stenosis. Now, numbness is usually worse. Numbness or heaviness or shooting pain down the legs. It could be any of those things, all of those things, or none of those things. But that's kind of how most people experience or describe it. And that is a, is a classic hallmark of stenosis. Now, in stenosis, it's usually worse when you're walking and then relieved by bending. Why? Because bending opens up the spinal canal. Bending opens up the spinal canal. But so this is starting, and we know from the MRI that there is stenosis here. So this is starting to sound a lot like stenosis. Uh, moreover, my issue is not fixed. It, it removes, it comes, goes from the right to the left. Uh, please reply. Ah, so episodic. You know, it's, it's happening. Something's triggering it. That, to me, uh, is this history and this imaging don't completely line up. So I would want to ask, if I had you live, Pradeep, I would ask you, well, do you get pain or um, numbness or heaviness or stiffness in your legs when you walk that's relieved by bending? If you do, that's a real strong sign that the problem is the stenosis. And if the problem is the stenosis, the solution is laminectomy surgery, laminectomy surgery. So that's the best I can do with the information I have here, but I think, I think that's what's going on with you. Uh, all right, uh, from Emanuela Ile. Emanuela, what a beautiful name. Um, thank you for your question. What is your opinion about the disc seal procedure? 
And this is from uh, my video on the number one neurosurgeon recommended treatment for a herniated disc. Okay, great question. Great question. So here's a spine, here's the bones, the vertebrae. Each one is separated by a disc. And you've seen my image before. The disc has two parts. There's a hard outer part and a soft inner part. And the outer part can crack, which allows herniation of the inner part. So some genius said, hey, if the problem is the crack in the outer part, why don't we put a patch on that that will cause the outer part to heal and that healing will keep the inner part in. And intuitively, it seems like a really good idea, right? It seems like a really good idea, but it hasn't turned out in practice. It, this disc sealants have been available for some time and it really has not caught on. Most surgeons have played around with it and just not found it to be tremendously useful. Why would that be? I'm out on a limb here, I don't have any direct evidence, and there is some clinical evidence that these disc, the companies that manufacture these devices and this material uh, point to, which would say it is a good thing. But the bottom line is, the problem is the annulus cracks and it doesn't heal very well because it has a very limited blood supply. The nucleus, the inside of the disc, has no blood supply. <laughs> I mean, not a... But the annulus, the outer part, it has a limited blood supply. Now, if the annulus was capable of healing, you wouldn't need that mesh, right? It would just heal up on its own. Now, when you put the mesh in, the mesh, no implant in the body is, by, is good for long by itself. And the analogy here is the paperclip. A uh, paperclip is very strong. And uh, no man on earth, no person on earth, could rip one in half most likely just by grabbing it and ripping it. But if you bend it over and over and over the ductility, what will happen very soon? Crack, it'll break in half. That's called ductility, the ability of a material to resist repeated, repeated movement. So when you put in that mesh, you have not changed the healing potential of the annulus. And the mesh itself is going to fail if it doesn't heal in. So basically, you didn't overcome a problem in the body with the implant. You just sort of, you're depending on the problem, the lack of healing, is what you're depending on healing to get your mesh to heal. So I think that's why this thing just hasn't turned out to be as good as we'd all hoped. But um, it's, it's something we should keep an eye on. Um, you know what I'd really love to see? I'd really love to see a 3D printed biological approach where we put something, not a mesh in there, but we put something in there that encourages the body to heal the annulus. Another thing that might help the body heal the annulus is stem cells, growth factor injections or stem cell injection. You know, you don't inject stem cells, they blow up and you get the growth factors. So growth factor injection that could really induce healing and get some to happen where, where our body needs it. So uh, <laughs> as, as is often the case, Emanuela, with the beautiful name, um, this was a long answer to a, a pretty simple question, but long answer is, eh, I'm not sure it's gonna work, but if it did, I'd be delighted. And it's an area that we should keep our eye on. That's, that's my take on the thing. Felipe Conrado, uh, can someone have a laminectomy without the need to fuse the spine? Great video. Thank you very much, Felipe. Um, th this was our video, Is There a Cure for Spinal Stenosis Without Surgery? I am so glad you asked this question because on the surface of it, it the question doesn't make sense, right? Yeah, I mean, here's the uh, lamina bone in the spine. The lamina is the roof of the spinal canal and a laminectomy is where they raise the roof. What's that got to do with fusion? Well, for the, it, a lot, as it turns out, historically. We have to look at the history in this case to understand this question from Felipe. The history is that for a long time, orthopedic surgeons said, if you do a laminectomy, you destabilize the spine and you have to do a fusion with it. So laminectomy and fusion were associated in many people's minds because for decades, these orthopedic surgeons did that. Um, honestly, that's nonsense. 
the stability of the spine has nothing to do with the lamina. It's from the joint and the ligaments inside. Now, what was destabilizing the spine in those laminectomies was those surgeons. They were going in and stripping out so much muscle. Remember, when they started doing these operations like laminectomy, they started doing these in the 40s and 50s. They would just strip down a ton of muscle. They had these vices that cranked open the spine. I mean, some legacy doctors actually still do this stuff today. It's just, in my mind, it's just nuts. It just kills the spinal stability. Now, the operation made you unstable, so then you needed a fusion. But the way they do this surgery today, it doesn't make you unstable. They make an incision that's uh, you know half an inch long, an inch, half an inch long. Then they put in a tube and look down it with a microscope. They don't cut one muscle fiber. They just spread them out of the way, look down a microscope. That's called microdiscectomy. Uh, minimally invasive is the use of the tubular retractor. And so, no, you do not need um, to have a fusion. And by the way, there are some of these uh, old crocodile surgeons, legacy spine surgeons out there. If you have a surgeon tell you, um, oh, well, you're having a laminectomy, and in my, they don't say words like, I trained so long ago, there's a lot better options today. No one says that to you, right? So what you, you have to learn to listen for the words which mean the same thing. You have to listen for the words that mean the same thing. The, if someone says something like, well, I find in my patients they do better if I do a fusion along with the laminectomy. Ding, 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 ding. Warning, 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 Will Robin, warning. That's, that translates into, I am so overly aggressive in the way that I do this surgery that I have to do a fusion that run away. Run away. That, that's not someone you want operating on you. That's a legacy surgeon. Find somebody good, someone who's fellowship trained if they're an orthopedic surgeon or a neurosurgeon who specializes in spine, does a high volume of spinal surgery, and does a minimally invasive approach. No other, no other approach is acceptable today, in my opinion. Funniest. Ah, I like your superlative uh, handle on your YouTube, Funniest. Um, what do I have to do for osteochondral injury? Osteochondral injury. Osteo means bone and chondral means cartilage. And this is in response to uh, my video. Is your knee pain coming from an ACL tear or meniscus injury? This is actually my colleague, Amy Kanata, Dr. Amy Kanata's video. Great video. It's our number one video on the channel. I strongly recommend it. It has to do with the soft tissue injuries to the knees. So here's a model of the knee. Let's turn this guy around backwards, or it could be a lady, and we see the cartilage in blue here on the thigh bone, and here are the two leg bones, and this is the meniscus that cushions. Here's the other meniscus, and you, oh, I'm sorry, the other meniscus is under there. This is the cruciate ligament shown back here. See how it's in the shape of a cross? It's the cruciate ligaments. So if... We look at it from the front. Here's the kneecap, the quadriceps tendon. If we pull this back, we see the patella, the kneecap removed. And on the inside is the patellofemoral space. That's where all that cartilage is. So um, a lesion of the meniscus or the anterior cruciate ligament, these are the so-called tears. Tears, they're soft tissue injuries. They're seen on... MRI, because X-ray and CT are, are CT, which is X-ray and X-ray, show bone. MRI shows soft tissue. So these soft tissue injuries, which can be seen only on MRI and can be suspected from physical examination, have nothing to do with osteochondral. Osteo is bone and chondral is cartilage. So, uh, well, I guess the cartilage part, but osteobone. So this osteochondral that refers to changes that happen with arthritis. What's arthritis? Arthritis is the breakdown of anything in blue. So it's this cartilage, and it's this cartilage. And arth arthritis, the problem is, let, so this is the knee bending. When this is smooth, I mean, baby, this is smooth. It glides, one glides across the other, and 
There's absolutely, it's beautiful. It's like a symphony. It's so wonderful and it's moving and there's no damage. They just, these parts just glide one past the other. Arthritis. Something happened, right? Now we've got a damaged blue area. Now, but even worse, okay, it's damaged. That stinks, right? That's bad. But even worse, now it moves. What happens? We're not smooth. I, I saw some, I saw an ice skating rink the other night. I went to a Christmas jazz review and I saw these skaters just moving beautifully across the ice. Well, that's not what's happening anymore. Now they're doing a hockey slide. They're scraping every, as they move, they're scraping the ice. The more arthritis causes more arthritis. So every movement now, osteochondral defect, these movements are grinding up the joint. So the reason I wanted to point this out is you should think about knee pain having like a fork in the road. Down one fork are these soft tissue injuries like the meniscus tears and the ACL tear. Down the other fork is the arthritis stuff osteochondral injuries, uh, uh, arthritis. These guys are treated by arthroscopic surgery, the soft tissue injuries, the arthroscope, uh, a, a torn anterior cruciate ligament can be reconstructed through an arthroscope. A meniscus can be shaved up and rotorooted. that's meniscectomy. Sometimes that meniscus actually in a young, a pers young person, person under 50, can be repaired and that's meniscal repair. So that's that fork. But this other fork, this is the synvisc injection, hyaluronic acid injection. We used to do steroid injection. Don't do that anymore. Don't do that anymore. Steroid injection causes worsening arthritis. We know, we know that now, right? So don't, don't even let a doctor talk you into that. That's a bad move. But hyaluronic acid injection, ding. Great, great treatment, um, probably. Um, and then in the worst case, if the arthritis gets really severe, then we're looking at knee replacement. When they're describing it as osteochondral injury, that reminds me of an MRI and uh, the kind of thing an MRI musculoskeletal radiologist would put on an MRI read. But you know, uh, the, the quick and dirty and frankly better, sometimes older, quicker, dirtier is actually better. An X-ray is, is actually a nicer image of arthritis than is uh, MRI in many cases. So if you haven't had an x-ray of your knee, funniest, I would recommend that you get one. And, uh, and look on the report at the severity of the arthritis. If you're, they, the often they'll put them either zero, no arthritis, one, a little bit, two, three, or even four. Those are, uh, you know, by the time you get to three and four, three is moderate, four is really severe marked arthritis. Three is synvisc injection or hyaluronic acid injection. Four is uh, total knee replacement. So that's the answer. Uh, good one. These are great questions, you guys. I really appreciate you asking them. Uh, Dr. Finacil Technic. Dr. Fin Financial Technic. Hello, doctor. It's so nice to meet you. Um, this is on the video of the number one neurosurgeon recommended treatment for a herniated disc. Uh, permanent leg pain gone in one year, but the buttock and groin pain is continuing for 15 years. Oh my God, that's too long to, uh, to have pain. I'm so sorry. I couldn't have solved that and I couldn't get to surgery just for the pain so hard. I'm not totally sure what you mean by this, but I think what I'm hearing in this question is, I think what you're saying is, I had a disc herniation 15 years ago I had radiating pain, sciatica, for some time. That went away. And now I've got this achy pain in my butt and it goes into my groin. I have seen this movie before, doctor. And um, I have to say, when I hear groin pain, my uh, antenna go up and I think, is this actually the hip? Is this actually the hip? Because hip pain radiates into the groin and this type of hip pain is often mistaken as back pain. It's often mistaken as back pain. How do you tell the difference? Well, it's actually really pretty easy, pretty easy. You lay on your back, bend your knee, flex your knee towards your chest, have somebody hold your knee, and then rotate your hip through the entire socket. 
when they're rotating that when they're rotating that hip, what is that doing to your um, what is that doing to your back? Let me give you a hint. So here's here's a person, and let's pretend they don't have an artificial hip. That this is not not what's going on. So now uh, you lay down on your bum. Here we'll reconstruct the situation here. You're laying down on your bum, and now I have you bend your knee, and I have somebody moving your hip through an entire range of motion. What's that got to do with your back? Nothing, <laughs> right? Nothing. So look at the back. There it is. There's nothing going on over there. This this goes with this. There's nothing. So uh, that's called passive range of motion of the hip. If passive range of motion of the hip reproduces your pain, then your issue is not a uh, back issue. It is a hip issue. If passive range of motion of the hip does not reproduce your pain, that raises the issue, is this actually a back issue? And if it is actually a back issue, it's probably a facet joint in the upper lumbar spine. I can't tell you why, but upper lumbar spine facets, the two, three, sometimes three, four, but usually one, two, or two, three, these facets can sometimes feel like groin pain, even though they're not. And so that is the way I would go about that. Confusing? Yeah, when, whenever you got, like we're not sure whether it's your hip or your back, whenever you start out with, we're not even sure which thing it is, these problems are complicated enough by themselves. But you use these methods, these physical exam methods like lying on your back and passive range of your hip or palpation of the joints along the spine to see which one is tender. You use these methods to get a hint as to where to focus the imaging. So if your passive range of motion of your hip is painful, I would get an x-ray of the hip. If passive range of motion of the hip is not painful and you are tender to palpation along the spine, along the facets, then I would get an x-ray of the low back with flexion and extension views. If that x-ray told me what I needed to know, great. If not, then I'd be looking at getting an MRI of one of those two structures based on what I saw. So that's... That's the basic, uh, that's how you move from physical examination to clinical suspicion to imaging. And then from the imaging back to the symptoms and then determine if there's a uh, an intervention that could ameliorate or eliminate those symptoms that would be worth the risk of doing. That's how the whole process kind of works. All right, great question. Um, it's best practice health. Hi, best practice health. And this is from uh, MHXPNB. Hi, MHXPNB. Hi, back. Um, I've been dealing with lower back issues for the last 10 years, L5S1. I finally just had radiofrequency ablation done on my left and right side, but it seemed not to work. I'm still in pain. The frustration and mental issues that follow with back issues don't help. Would this operation be helpful? And uh, the, the, pr the video they were asking about was on radiofrequency ablation pros and cons, and they were talking about direct visualized rhizotomy or endoscopic, uh, where you go in and visualize the medial branch to the spine causing joint pain and cut it. Uh, yes, so radiofrequency ablation, RFA, is effective in 60% of patients. Now that means all of those patients had a test block, a medial branch block, that relieved their pain through the treatment window, presumably these days. So it seemed like the pain was coming from the, coming from the facet joint. It seemed like the pain was coming from the facet joint because that's the only thing that a medial branch block blocks. And yet then they had radiofrequency ablation and 60% of them got relief, six out of 10. How come? <laughs> it's, it's a legitimate question. How come? Why isn't it 90%, 95%, 100%, 60%, that's six out of 10. What about those other 40%? What happened? Well, what happened was they missed. Um, th well, there, there's two possibilities. One possibility is they missed. They, they put the needle in to do the radiofrequency ablation, but they couldn't see the pain fiber. They put it where it was supposed to be, but it's not always there. It's not always there. 
And so you put, they, they could have put the needle in exactly the right place based on the x-ray, based on everything they knew, and they buzzed it just like they were supposed to. And it didn't work because your nerve fiber wasn't there. So that's the reality is it doesn't always work. And it works about six out of 10 times. What I would recommend if you're in the four out of 10, and this person, uh, MHXPNB, is in the four out of 10. So your medial branch block worked, but now your radiofrequency ablation didn't. You're four out of 10. I would recommend repeating the medial branch block. If the medial branch block temporarily eliminates the pain again, they missed. And that means that uh, you need to consider your next step. You have two possibilities. You could have the uh, RFA again. Then maybe they'll get it this time. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a, a, like my chairman used to say, even a blind pig finds an acorn once in a while. Right? <laughs> you know, so they can't see what they're doing, but they may, maybe they'll get it, which would be great. And then you'd get an average of 10 months relief at an 80% level, which would be really cool. Another possibility, if that is just not an option for you, or you're sick of it, or you're, um, you, have, uh, you have the ability to get direct visualized rhizotomy, then, then this is the right situation to try DVR. DVR is where they go in, not with a, a radio frequency ablation probe, but they go in with an endoscope. They find the little pain fiber, they find that little bugger, and they get them. They buzz them, or cut them in half, or they get rid of them. So they do it under direct vision. That's the D in DVR, direct visualized rhizotomy. Uh, it's also called dorsal radiofrequency endoscopic radionucleolysis, or you know, there's a lot of different names for it. But um, that is generally done by surgeons. There's usually one person in the community who is an endoscopic surgeon. Some communities, there's more than one. But that endoscopic person is the one, not microscopic, endoscopic, endoscopic. That endoscopic surgeon is the one who can do this procedure for you. And uh, yeah, you're, you're a candidate for that. Oh, okay. Oh, hey, thank you. We got somebody in the chat with a question. Uh, Bailey? Uh-huh. Okay, Bailey has spinal stenosis. She's had it over years. She's done a variety of treatments. They are radiofrequency ablation, exercise. What were the other ones? Um, uh, physical therapy, chiropractic care, um, and, the, and uh, they haven't worked. Um, is there anything else I can do? Well, let me point out something, first of all, Bailey, and this is super important. First of all, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate you listening and, and bringing your question forward. So first of all, stenosis means narrowing. And all of the things that you just listed off are treatments for back problems, but none of them are treatments for stenosis. Radiofrequency ablation is a treatment for joint pain of the spine. Joint pain is not narrowing. It's a, that's a, the joint problems can lead to narrowing, but that's, that's not the same thing. So radiofrequency ablation was never gonna help your stenosis. Exercises, you can't make a small hole wider by exercise. That does, there's no, there's, think about that. There's no there there. It's not possible. So that was not a treatment. Um, medications, uh, anti-inflammatories, exercises, none of these things are treatments for spinal stenosis. You know what else is not a treatment for spinal stenosis? Epidural injection. We did that for a long time. When someone came in with uh, nerve root pain due to stenosis, we would send them for epidural injection, but then a randomized controlled trial was done and showed it really had absolutely no benefit. There's only one treatment for stenosis. There's only one way when the spinal canal is too narrow, Bailey, here's your spinal canal, and your nerves are being crushed, it's too narrow. There's only one way to make a small hole bigger, and that is to raise the roof. Laminectomy surgery, it's the only treatment there is. In the early stages, activities help keep the, the symptoms down. 
Motion is lotion, blah, blah, blah. Exercise is never a bad thing and it's good for your body. Radiofrequency ablation helps with joint pain. But when the spine, when the hole is too small, the roof has to be raised to make it bigger. That's laminectomy surgery, L-A-M-I-N-E-C-T-O-M-Y, laminectomy surgery. We've got a bunch of videos on it on the uh, channel. Check out the playlist and go with that. But that's the only treatment for spinal stenosis. Here's the good news. The spinal, oh, by the way, spinal stenosis is very often combined with degenerative disc disease. And the reason is very simple. Stenosis is caused by, stenosis is narrowing. Well, what narrows? What narrows is the, um, the, the joints of the spine, which are the walls, get thicker. So the walls are moving in. The ligament responds to the excess force by thickening, so the roof is coming down and the disc bulges back, so the floor is coming up. That's what causes spinal stenosis. What caused all those changes to happen in the first place was degenerative disc disease. So your disc is your shock absorber. When your disc degenerated, that caused your joints to enlarge. That caused your excess force, the ligament to thicken. That caused the degenerative disc, all these things are crushing me. It's all happening because of the degenerative disc disease. But the problem now is the stenosis, not the degenerative disc disease. You can't, the body, the human body does not work in reverse. Okay, so now we fix the degenerative disc disease. Everything else is going to be okay, right? Wrong. The, the ligament is too thick. The roof has come down. The, jo- the, bo- the bones are still too, the joints are still too big. The walls are, have moved in. You know, all of this stuff has happened. The degenerative disc disease is no longer the problem. It was the cause, but it's not the solution. The solution is L-A-M-I-N-E-C-T-O-M-Y, laminectomy, laminectomy surgery. Um, By the way, I've got my first uh, music video coming out this week. (laughs) My song on on, uh, the eight nights of knee pain set to the uh, 12 nights of Christmas is going to come out this week, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, no, I cannot sing, as you can probably tell in my laminectomy song till now. <laughs> but, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be fun, and uh, hopefully it's educational for you. All right, uh, Anna Simskova. Uh, thank you, Doc. You're welcome, Anna, uh, for making that video. It was my pleasure. I wonder if you could talk more about desiccated and cracked discs and approaches to treat them. And then she talks about a really important, a really true thing that the majority of videos show this healthy disc that tears and then the herniation. And um, that is very often those, that's a, a disc herniation with sciatica. But there is a very significant group. It's about 4%. It's about 4% of people with back pain actually have an annular tear where the tear in the disc is the whole problem. The problem is not the soft part uh, herniating out or bulging out or blah, blah, blahing it, blah, blah, blah. The problem is the tear, and that's called an annular tear. And uh, we used to think this was not real. Uh, It was actually uh, an anatomist, uh, a guy from Australia. I'm blanking on his name, but super smart guy, and he called it internal disc disruption internal disc disruption. And he did a lot of studies that using MRI that really showed that internal disc disruption is a much more common cause of back pain than we used to believe. I still think it's 40. It's 4%. This guy, uh, uh, his name will come to me, but I think he thinks it's more like 40%. So he thinks it's very common, maybe the most common cause, internal disc disruption. Anyway, so what's the treatment for it, for annular tear or internal disc disruption? Well, first of all, how do you, before that, how do you know you have it? You can see it clear as day on MRI. Uh, it's called a hot zone, or uh, you can see a little white tear in the disc on the sagittal cut of the MRI. So if you look at your MRI report, it'll tell you whether you have a torn disc. Not all torn discs are painful, but um, pain can be coming from a torn disc. So you have to sort of correlate the two. Um, If you have internal disc disruption and it's evident on MRI and it feels like that knife in the back, that's how a torn disc, when a torn disc is the cause of your pain, it doesn't usually feel like it's in your butt. It doesn't feel like it's radiating to your hip. 
It's not generally way off to one side. It's not associated with tenderness to palpation. The doctor can't push on it and make it hurt. All those things are joint problem. All those things are a joint problem. It's not generally like electricity running down your leg. That's sciatica. That's from the herniated disc. It's not generally numbness and tingling in your leg when you walk. That's stenosis or narrowing. It's a knife in the back. It's a knife in the back pain. If you have that kind of pain and the MRI shows the annular tear, she says, okay, great. Thanks a lot, doc. You've done what everyone else did. You, you haven't told me what to do. Well, uh, it's actually the area for which we have the worst treatments. So it's, it's, people do try to avoid it, but let's just dig in. Okay, let's say that is your problem and the MRI confirms it and that is the pattern and that's what we're dealing with. How do you treat it? Um, let me begin by saying this information is suspect. This is not strongly proven. If you said, oh, I demand to see the evidence, I really can't provide it to you. We're in a shady area. Anna, we're in a shady area here. But let me, but nevertheless, if you have the pain, you have the pain and you want to know your options. So let me tell you your options. Number one is growth factor injection into the disc. So I wouldn't think this would work, but my goodness, because the problem is there's limited healing in the disc. But um, growth factor injections into the discs are emerging. A lot of people are trying them and having good results. On the pyramid of evidence that I like to talk about, we're at the bottom. This is this is crappy of it, right? This is the worst information. Some guy said it works, <laughs> right? But uh, that's how everything starts out. So that's where this is. Growth factor injection into the disc is definitely something I would consider if it were me. Second possibility is denervation of the disc. This is a new thing just approved by the FDA. It's called Denervex, D-E-N-E-R-V-X, Denervex, Denervex procedure. It's generally done by pain management physicians. The idea is to ablate the nerve that goes into the disc so you can't feel it anymore. The problem is that nerve is in a, it's a, called the basivertebral nerve. It's in a difficult to reach spot. It's hard to ablate. And there's often more than one nerve contributing these fibers. So it's not as, it's easier said than done. But <coughs> Denervex, definitely an option. And then when all else fails, you can have the disc removed and get a fusion. However, that is the, when people say, well, what are the three indications for fusion? They are scoliosis, spondylolisthesis with stenosis, and uh, recurrent disc herniation and instability. Having said that, most, disc, most fusions are actually done for degenerative disc disease, a condition for which they're not actually usually approved even though it's the most common thing, because there is no other good treatment. It's just, it's a crap situation, but you gotta play the hand you're dealt, right? You know what's really crappy? Being in pain. <laughs> That's what, you know what's really crappy? Pain, pain is crappy. So it's one of those things where uh, the information is shady, we're at the bottom of the pyramid, but if it's your problem, this is the best information there is today. So. Let me know how it goes for you. First, I feel sorry for you, but I hope for, and I hope for the best. And you will do well. Uh, by the way, uh, a lot of people say, okay, there's no good treatment. I'll just wait it out. It doesn't work to wait it out. It does not heal well on its own. And so uh, the difference between you with the back pain and three years from now, you with the back pain is three years of back pain. So it, you gotta you gotta make a decision and do something. All right. Uh, Sunak Ritzy, Risky, Ritzy, Roy. Oh, Sunak Roy. Hello. Thank you. I'm sorry for butchering your name. It doesn't. It's, it's actually a really interesting name. I wish I wish I knew, was pronouncing it right. But um, this is a question on our video. Is your knee pain coming from an ACL tear or a meniscus? And just for reference, from the back, this is the meniscus. This is the ACL. So we're talking about the soft tissue structures. The meniscus is the shock absorber for the knee, and the ACL prevents forward and backward translation of the knee is for stability. Um, can you tell me why does my knee pop? If I keep my knee just relaxed while lying down and sometimes I get the urge to pop it, it feels like there is some bubble between my bones. I don't get pain. Well, this is the age old question. Why does it pop? And chiropractors have, uh, they make their living popping joints. So they really interested in this question. There's been every kind of theory. One theory is that there is air 
that is released from synovial fluid. And that really does fit. A lot of people feel like you do, like there's pressure and it's relieved by the pop. Could that be the fluid moving? Is it the bone moving? What is it? Long story short, no one knows. There has been a lot, remember how your mom always told you not to pop? Don't pop your neck, don't pop your knee. Well, uh, your mom was right about everything else, but not that. There's, they, they have not demonstrated, there have been attempts at looking at developing worse pathologies and popping of joints, and really haven't found any correlation that I'm aware of. So popping is not harmful. We don't really know what it is. You're not gonna go blind. You're not gonna grow hair on your palms. You just stop it. It's, we don't know what it is, uh, but um, should you do it? Uh, you know, I, my own feeling is um, if you think that popping would help you, go see a doctor who pops. Go see a chiropractor and, and get, get the experience of a doctor give, looking at your station, trying to figure out, well, clearly something's not great, right? It's not, pop, you didn't pop like that when you were 15 and healthy as a horse. So uh, is there something else going on that could be fixed now before it gets worse? and then can't be fixed easily with changes in station. So I think it's worth seeing a chiropractor or a physical therapist and getting an evaluation and making sure everything else is as good as it can be. But uh, what is it? We don't know. Ate, A-T-E, uh, Pam, oh, eight Pams Eat. Eight, eight Pams Eat. Hello, eight Pams Eat. This is on the number one neurosurgeon recommended treatment for a herniated disc. What about, I'm having right now, doctor, but I'm pregnant. I, oh, I don't know the remedy. My hip hurts so bad. I'm 26 weeks pregnant. I was wearing my shoe in a squat position that it hurts when I get up. I don't know if it's a slip disc or something else, but I am uh, taking B complex. Good, that's a prenatal vitamin. And it goes away, but I, I don't think I can take any medications uh, because I'm pregnant. Please help me. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. That's... This actually happens a lot. Uh, pregnancy, as you might imagine, adding 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds right in the front of you um, is really rough on your back, and it's not uncommon to get a disc herniation. Uh, you can't have an x-ray. X-rays are, are radiation, radioactive particles that go through your body that go right through that developing fetus and cause problems. So x-ray is out, but MRI is in. There have been many studies of MRI of uh, fetal cells in culture. There's no known mutagenic response to MRI. MRI is a fluctuating magnetic field. Our magnetic fields are fluctuating all around us all the time, every day. It is not teratogenic. It doesn't cause birth defects to have an MRI as far as we know. So the way to find out what's wrong is to have a physical examination and then based on that exam, whether it's your hip or your back, have an MRI, not a CT scan, not an X-ray, but an MRI, perfectly safe for the baby, and then going from there. There are many things which just can't be done during pregnancy because of the need for X-ray or whatever, but there are many things that can, and um, one of the most common ones is bed rest. Rest is the, you know, rest is the old treatment which we got rid of because we have better things today. But sometimes when you can't do the better things, you gotta go back to what used to work. And so see your, uh, your expert is going to be your OBGYN. They're your quarterback, but then you'll wanna see a neurosurgeon as well. And I think she mentioned in the, in the um, uh, question that she's already planning to see a neurosurgeon. So, oh, I'm so sorry. No good deed goes unpunished. Hang in there. Um, there will be treatments. They can make you better. Uh, it's gonna be different though. And so you have to be patient, but yeah, good job. We're running out of time, so let's get through as many of these as we can. I'm just gonna rapid fire the rest of them because I don't wanna leave anyone behind, okay? Let's do it. Um, I need a one-to-one -one session like this too. Emanuela, Emanuela again, the beautiful Emanuela name. Um, absolutely, I'd love to interview you uh, online. You gotta do two things, join up, so subscribe to the channel. All members are candidates to have to have one-on-one -on -one sessions. There's no charge for that. Click through on the channel and go to our website, request more information. I have a staff here, they'll be glad to help you get on the show. So please come on, I would love to talk to you. Uh, Michael Williams says, what does minimally invasive mean? Anterior approach, question mark. Uh, minimally invasive, Michael Williams, means less invasive than how we used to do it. 
So minimally invasive knee replacement is quadriceps sparing robotic assisted. Minimally invasive spine surgery is metrics tubular retractor. So it, the, the, the tag varies based on what surgery we're talking about. It just means less invasive. Anterior, no. Anterior means from the front, so different, different word. Uh, man in America, man in America, um, what happens if the pain is just in my buttocks and doesn't go down my leg much? Is this still from a herniated disc? Probably not. That's probably either an annular tear or a facet. And the best way to know is look at my, look at, I have several videos on facet pain and on discogenic pain. Go through those playlists and help figure out which one because the treatments are totally different depending on the cause. Um, Recon 2671, I've been a corrections officer for 20 years. I see a lot of those guys back when I was in practice. It's very difficult work. Injured my right knee twice, experiencing and diagnosed with patellofemoral syndrome. Can trauma cause this? Hell yes. Uh, trauma can definitely cause it. Very common cause, post-traumatic arthritis. Patellofemoral syndrome is basically arthritis in the, in the uh, space between the patella, the kneecap, and the femur, the thigh bone. So uh, definitely. And maybe even appropriate to think of a workman's comp claim, depending if there was one incident that happened. Uh, Manusha Virana, I had a tibial plateau fracture uh, two years, had surgery with plates, now I'm having knee pain. Is it an ACL tear or a meniscus? When, so basically, because you had the fracture and you have hardware in there, you've got an added potential source. So it's usually soft versus hard tissue, arthritis versus ACL or meniscus. And then when you throw into that, now the prior fracture in the hardware could be that too. So instead of a fork, you've got a triangle. And uh, the way that you tell if it's the hardware is you try to palpate it on exam, have the doctor try to move it. And if they can't tell, they can numb it up and see if that eliminates the pain. If numbing the hardware eliminates the pain, then that's probably the cause. All right, I hope that helps. Complex situation. Definitely, by the way, you gotta be seeing a sports medicine doc. You've got a complex situation there. Don't go see your uh, routine legacy orthopedic surgeon. You want to, you definitely, everyone should see an expert, you especially. RV Valencia, hello, sir. Hi, doc. Hello. After the microdiscectomy, my left knee, my left leg started to feel numbness and tingling one week now. Yeah, it's very common. Uh, the disc is actually the shock absorber, but if you look at it, the disc also determines the height of the level. And if you, damage a disc and they collapse, you can compress the nerve. And oftentimes after microdiscectomy, the collapse gets worse on the other side. So it's not uncommon for the pain to switch sides. Rest, wait, think about epidural. Usually that goes away by itself. If it doesn't, you're probably headed for fusion. That would make me think that that inner space is unstable and things are going bad. Uh, TCM McNaughey. Question, so RFA ablation works. Is that the next best step for me? Because I'm physically getting my ablation two days from now. See if the RFA helps. Yeah, if the RFA fails, then you should consider DVR. That's exactly right. Harsha Harika, hi. Hi, I had this issue. It started a year ago. In the beginning, the spinal canal diameter was 9.5. Then it was 6 point something. What do I do? Spinal stenosis is progressive. Watch my playlist on stenosis. It always gets worse. MRI may show it going up and down, but that's because of the sectioning error of the MRI. It always gets worse. If you're having symptomatic stenosis now, you need surgery if you're healthy enough to have it. It's Elaine the Martyr. <laughs> I love it. I love Hi, Elaine the Martyr. It's good to hear from you. You just answered my question. Patients can't skip RFA and get DVR because of the insurance. That's exactly right. But if all other things being equal, would I have DVR first? I would have DVR first if I, um, I had only one and done. If I only had one shot to get better, I would take the DVR. But if, I, if that was not the situation, why not try the RFA? It's a 60% chance of working 80% for 10 months. Ah, do that. And then if it comes back, I would go to DVR. That's, that's the way I would handle it. Well, Elaine the Martyr, you're the last question, and I think I'm out of time. So it uh, looks like a war zone around here today with all these models. Uh, thanks, you guys, so much for all your questions. It's really, really nice to uh, start winding up the year with you. Uh, next year, uh, Christmas is coming. I think we're going to miss the show next week for Christmas. I'll check on that. If we do make it live, I'll see you then. But I'm looking forward to seeing you soon, one more time at least before the end of the year. Keep your questions coming. 
I love getting them. And uh, exciting stuff on the horizon. Pretty soon we're gonna have a, um, the ability to submit questions by video. So you can just take your phone and ask me your question, bang it out, and then I'll be able to see you and I think give you a much stronger answer. So I'm really looking forward to that and I'm looking forward to trying to help you get the information you need to get better. Happy Merry Christmas uh, for best practice. This is Dr. Dan Lieberman. Have a great weekend. If you have a question you would like answered on Best Practice Live, click the link to our website and complete the submission form. The more information you can give us, the better we can answer your question. So please contact us and we can walk you through uploading your imaging to a secure server. Please like and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with information about your spine and joint health.